Since 1945, the United States has attempted to overthrow more than 50 foreign governments. In the process, the US has caused the end of life for several million people and condemned many millions more to a life of agony and despair. Afraid of your melanin, the same as it's ever been That ain't gonna change with the race of the president I see imperialism under your skin tone You could call it Christopher Columbus Syndrome Is it a world nation or an abomination? 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 The world's entertainer, the world's devastator From Venezuela to Mesopotamia Your cameras lie cause they have to hide the savage crimes committed on leaders That happen to try and nationalise eating competitions While the world's been starving Beat up communism with the help of Bin Laden Where would your war of terror be without that man? Every day you create more Nadal Hassan's Kill a man from the military, you're a weirdo But kill a wog from the Middle East, you're a hero Your country is causing screams that never reach your ear holes America inflicted a million ground zeros Follow the dollar and swallow your humanity Soldiers committing savagery you never even have to see Those mad at me, writing emails angrily I'm not anti-America, America is anti-me Libya has not attacked United States, Britain or France Libya is targeted because Libya feeds its people, clothes its people, houses its people. The Libyan regime uses the mineral wealth of Libya for the benefit of its people, and imperialism cannot tolerate that example. Libya stands for independence, for African unity, and for supporting liberation movements everywhere. <laughs> Friends, I have already taken too much of your time. There's just one thing that I like to say in conclusion. That is, we are a small organization in our country, but whatever we can do, we shall do to tell the truth to the working class of Britain, Europe, and America, and all over the world. And what you can be certain of is our absolute solidarity with you. Whatever the cost to us, we will stand with the Libyan people in the hour of their need. Yeah. The Libyan opposition are paid agents of imperialism. It's precisely for that reason we think the only leader and the only government that befits the Libyan people is the government of Colonel Gaddafi, and we say victory to the Libyan people led by the Libyan government under the leadership of Brother Gaddafi, death to imperialism, death to Anglo-American and French imperialism. Thank you for listening to me. شكرا شكرا برنار برار هاربر رئيس الحزب الشيوعي البريطاني على هذا التصريح I have no excuse other than the fact that I didn't notice the time zone, so it's entirely my fault. There's no pain problems, nothing of the sort. If I can't tell you the truth on my travel arrangements, I can't be expected to tell the truth on Libya, so it's very, very important that I, 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 I tell you that. Now, first of all, what I really like to say that is, Ours was only partly a fact finding because as far as I'm concerned, what I found in Libya was not very different from what I thought and what I knew would be in, in, in Libya. Ours was actually the trip of honor, namely to rescue the honor of the British working class and go and say to them, yes, the majority of the people may not be demonstrating in favor of you. Our government and our ruling class may be bombing the hell out of you, but there are honest representatives of the British working class who are with you and who will be with you, whatever the cost to us. That is really what the purpose of the project was.
nothing short of the that the, in this presently imperialist war. Over the last 98 days, and on Sunday, it will be 100 days since the bombing by NATO of Lib Libya started. They have been involved, the NATO um, armed forces, in 12,070 air sorties, of which 4,569 have been armed, which means these are the 4,569 in which they actually drop bombs on targets in, 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 in Libya. And they hit, out of that, 2,125 targets. When uh, uh, NATO countries went to the United Nations, they asked for a resolution. And the resolution stated that it was very necessary to actually intervene in Libya in order to prevent Colonel Gaddafi's regime from murdering and harming civilians. There is no truth to this. Um, Colonel Gaddafi's regime was not involved in harming civilians. A counter-revolutionary rebellion had broken out in a number of cities in Libya well planned not only by the counter revolutionaries who themselves really are no force, they cannot match the uh, Libyan armed forces. They were aided, abetted, advised in every possible way by the CIA, by the MI6. They rose in rebellion and what happened in a rebellion? The government of the country suppresses the rebellion. This is no different from any other country. We've had rebellions in our country, and they were sorted out by the people in the country. Whether one side wins or the other, that is up to the balance of forces. We had the revolution in the 17th century, and the parliamentary forces rose in rebellion. And quite naturally, Charles I responded by attempting to suppress. Of course, the Charles I was on the wrong side of history, and what's more, did not have the support of the overwhelming majority of the people of this country, and Charles came off it rather unwell um, of, 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 the, of the whole, whole um, and enterprise. He did not live to learn the lesson that you don't do things like that. The United States of America had a civil war from 1861 to 64, when the southern slave owning uh, states rose in rebellion, and Abraham Lincoln's um, forces, uh, headed by some very competent generals like Sherman and others, suppressed that rebellion. What would you have expected Abraham's government to do? So, what do you? Why do you expect anything different from Colonel Gaddafi's regime? There's a counter-revolutionary rebellion, and his forces literally, first of all, they were quite kind to them. They thought, let's see how we how we take this. But after, after a few weeks, they decided that this was really not a joke. This had to be suppressed. And they swept all the way right up to Benghazi. And that's when NATO forces stopped, started uh, bombing. That is on the 19th of March, March this year. And they went there on the pretext of the United Nations resolution to protect civilians. Now, first of all, in my view, the United Nations had no right to pass this resolution. The United Nations Charter does not allow interference by any foreign body, including the United Nations, in matters of that nature. It's only in circumstances where the actions of one country are so threatening to the peace and stability of the area that the United Nations can actually intervene. But the way that this resolution was passed is five members, of the, permanent members of the United Nations Security Council cook up an agreement with each other. And increasingly the situation is becoming clear that the United Nations Security Council, since the collapse of the Soviet Union, has become the colonial office of imperialism. Once the five members have agreed, everything is fine then. And then they try and coerce non-permanent members to vote for the resolution. And they did. And they were coerced. And it's most disgusting that South Africa, whose liberation movement had such support from Colonel Gaddafi's regime, should actually have voted for that particular resolution. Anyway, they passed that resolution. But even once that resolution is passed, what does the resolution <coughs> say? It establishes a no-fly zone over the Libyan airspace, which means that the regime's air force cannot take to the sky. It was well discussed in newspapers, from tabloids to very prestigious newspapers like the Financial Times, 
that no fly zone will not help us achieve our aims. Because a no fly zone is what it says, i.e., the Air Force cannot fly. But it means it was perfectly clear then that the artillery, the tanks, and the government forces would be free to move all over the country. No, that's not what has happened. NATO's forces have bombed the government forces in order to actually turn NATO into an air force of the insurgents. Never had such a weak ragtag rag insurgency had such a powerful air force in the world. The nearest it came to was in the Yugoslav war, where the NATO became basically an air force for the counter-revolutionary Kos Kosovo army. This is being repeated now in the case of, case of uh, uh, Libya. And NATO has been bombing targets. And as a result of bombing, not only have they harmed the military installations and military establishments of Libya, they have actually killed over 800 people in Libya. There has been a fierce fighting going on between the government forces and the insurgents around the town of Miserata. Over a period of three months, there have been 250 casualties. Fierce fighting between two sides in a civil war and only 250 killed. Mm. NATO, on the other hand, which has gone into Libya under the pretext of protecting civilians, has killed 800 people. NATO does not admit to doing that. Libyans tell me, and you say, how do I know it's 800? For the simple reason, comrades, I believe the Libyan government a thousand times more than our imperialist masters who tell the lies. On the <laughs> and there are other agencies, people who are in the business of finding out what's happening, who would corroborate what I'm trying to tell you. Last Sunday, NATO bombed somebody's house and killed nine people, including two children. <laughs> on Monday, it killed another 15. Just in order to keep some credibility, NATO admitted and said sorry for the Sunday bombing. So of the 800 they've killed, they've said sorry for the nine civilians that they have killed. That is the way NATO actually tries to tell the truth. NATO has no business to be bombing targets, civilian or military. NATO's jo job was to prevent the Libyan air forces from taking to the skies. Libyan Air Forces have actually complied with this unjust resolution and not taken to the skies, uh, even if they were in a position to, which I don't think they are in, in a position to. And what NATO has become, it's actually nothing short of a gang of international gangsters who actually act as an assassination squad for assassinating the leadership of any country they do not happen to like. The UN resolution was a no-fly zone to protect civilians. But from the very beginning, it was clear that NATO was not actually seeking to protect civilians. It was not actually trying to uh, enforce the no-fly zone. It actually was there to regime change in order to overthrow the government of uh, uh, Libya and install their own puppets, puppets in their place. This is what they are actually engaged in doing. But they're not, they've not had much luck. Things have gone bad. After three months, the imperialist combined air forces have been unable to topple the regime of Colonel Gaddafi. They've bombed the places where they thought he was. They've killed one of his sons. They've killed three of his grandchildren, two of them babies, one of them a child of 15 months. We probably still call them babies. They've killed babies. and. This, they say, was targeting control and command center. There is absolutely no connection between language and thought. Reactionaries have become revolutionaries. Imperialists have become freedom-loving liberators of humanity. And people who look after their own people are described as authoritarian, as dictatorial, and that's how Colonel Gaddafi has been described. Libya is tar targeted. You may ask, this country, whose population is the size of the population of Wales, yeah. six million, what has it done against us that it should be so targeted? The answer to that is, it has things which imperialism covets. 
Ella told me a joke recently, she heard from somebody, that after the Napoleonic Wars, uh, the French minister Talleyrand met uh, uh, Duke of Wellington. And the Duke didn't like Talleyrand very much. I'm sorry, I can't pronounce properly Talleyrand's name, but you, you will know what it means. And Wellington said to Talleyrand, you know, the trouble with the French is they fight for money, whereas we British fight for honor. <laughs> to, which, to which Talleyrand replied, each one of us fights for that which it's most lacking in. <laughs> <laughs> so, Britain is fighting what it thinks it needs and Libya should not have, namely oil. So, that is the prize. What else has Libya done that's wrong apart from sitting on 46, 45.6 billion barrels of oil which account for 3% of the proven oil reserves of the world. And before the conflict started it produced 1.6 million barrels of oil which represented 2 percentage points of the world daily oil production. And it brought in over 5 billion dollars uh, every, every month to Libya's coffers. So Britain would like, and France would like, and United States would like to have their mitts on the soil. They haven't had the success of actually be, being able to impose the kind of deals that they're used to. The kind of deal, deal that East India Company used to impose on the Indians. You know, where you actually don't indulge in trade, you indulge in looting, you indulge in pickpocketing. That's the best thing to do. Trade is hard work. You've got to produce, you've got to exchange, and that's just not good enough. <coughs> what else has Libya done which is wrong? At the time of Libya's independence in 1951, Libya's per capita income per year was $50, the lowest in the world. Today, Libya's per capita income, according to 2008 figures, is $16,600 US dollars per annum. Now, that is not only the highest income in the continent of Africa, it actually fares very, very um, comfortably with the lives of people in West European countries. At the time of independence, 95% of Libya's population was illiterate. Today, 5% of the population is illiterate, which is actually higher than the United States, where more than 10% of the population is functionally illiterate. <laughs> How dare a third world poor country, uh, tribal uh, not so long ago and still tribal considerably, how dare it have higher educational standards than Uncle Sam. The life expectancy at the time of, uh, um, in, in the 1951 uh, 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 was something like 43 years. It's 73 years now. At the, compared with the earlier time when there were 115 um, uh, infant uh, mortalities for every uh, thousand live births, today there are mere 18. So a whole load of human rights development indexes, Libya is way ahead. Libya was voted onto the United Nations Human Rights Council in May 2010 by a voting majority of 152 out of something like 176 a kind of landslide, if you like. Only this March, a report was being prepared by the Human Rights Development Council, which were put Libya in the front ranks of countries that respected human rights, from women's health, women's education, women's participation in public life, to education, health, gen gen generally, generally speaking, and more, cooperating with other international organizations in the matter of fighting against human trafficking, narcotics, and, and so on and so forth. Just as the, United, as the Human uh, Rights uh, uh, Council was actually considering that, Libya started to be bombed. For doing what? For violation of human rights. <laughs> it, just, it just doesn't, 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 uh, doesn't work there. What else could Libya have done which was wrong? Libya has a very proud record of supporting national liberation movements all over the world. It supported not only the ANC, it supported the other Southern uh, African uh, liberation movements from Ang Ang Angola to, uh, to, South to Southwest Africa uh, and of course 
uh, exported some national liberation movements not very far from this room. <laughs> and this, of course, rankles much with, with British imperialism. It has a very long memory. It's got a memory like a camel. It does not forget. <laughs> and we should also have a memory like a camel, and we do not forget the crimes of imperialism. And we side with people who are fighting against, against imperialism. This war is not something that's come all of a sudden. This war was well prepared. It doesn't happen that on 17th of March, the United Nations Security Council passed this resolution, and on 19th, all the air forces of the leading imperialist countries are ready and bombing everywhere. You've got to assemble this armada somehow. They were waiting. They're like the vultures waiting to get a go-ahead. And they got the go-ahead once the United Nations Security Council had passed the resolution. And the resolution, of course, was disgusting because it gave the NATO powers all the necessary measures allegedly to help protect Williams. And what would all the necessary measures be? You think NATO countries are going to stick by law? You think they're going to stick by the words of the resolution? No, they'll extend it as much as, as, as they possibly could. And they have. They are bombing civilian targets, they're killing civilians, and they have killed more civilians than would have been killed by now in the civil war between the two sides because the counter-revolutionary would have been driven out of Benghazi and there would have been peace and quiet in Libya. I have no doubt of, of, of that. Um, yesterday's Financial Times carried an article and it expressed certain disquiet that the bombing campaign has, had not been as successful as it should be. I'd like to read to you a quotation because it's so hilarious and yet so tragic. At the heart of the difficulties facing NATO coalition, coalition remains the stubbornness of Colonel Gaddafi and his acolytes. You know, why don't they just roll over? Why are they being stubborn? You know, it's like a big guy beating a little child and saying, why are you being so stubborn and crying as I beat you? Why don't you simply roll over? So it's the stubbornness, you know, had he just simply complied with NATO's wishes, then there would be no need for bombing. There will be, of course, the peace of the graveyard. And then they go on to say, for all the defections that have taken place, there have not been the cracks in the regime that make his departure a certainty. The Libyan leader remains protected by a network of armed civilians. What, a, what, what an admission. It's not armed forces of Libya, armed civilians. Which tyrant in the world actually gives a gun to every one of his inhabitants? I asked David Cameron to give a gun to every British person. And I asked Her Majesty's opposition, the Labour Party, to support, to support this move, to support this request of ours, that every British person, in the interest of British liberty, should be given a gun. AK-47 specifically. Oh, that's, that's also a gun. And then, and then it goes on to say the Financial Times, nor outside the rebel area, that's Benghazi, have there been any popular uprisings against him. And this is what the Financial Times is saying. So there's no popular uprising against the regime. There are some insurgents supported by the CIA and the MI6, and Colonel Gaddafi is stubborn, because he won't roll over, and he's supported by a whole load of network of civilians uh, who, are, who are armed. Well, that shows it's a popular regime, which has the support of the popular people. And let me tell you, three quarters of the population of Libya live in an area which was generally known as Tripolitana, i.e. Tripoli and the surrounding area. Although Libya is a large country, its population is concentrated either around Benghazi, and a few cities uh, on, on the coast are mostly in the Tripoli area and the, and the surrounding districts. And that is where the rebels have little or no sport whatever. And when you go there, there are pictures my comrades have put, put up which, which we brought. If you go to the, the, the market in Tripoli, there are, <coughs> this market is full of goods. If you go into the, the vegetable section, you would not want to shop in Waitrose. <laughs> it really is the most exquisite, fantastic vegetable. You go to the fish market, there's table after table selling different kinds of fish. 
I'm no expert on fish, but they were different. They didn't look all alike. <laughs> if you went into the, into the meat section, there were chicken, there were beef, there were lamb, whatever you wanted to have, apart from whatever is religiously forbidden, that, namely pork, you could get any kind of meat. In fact, some of my friends who were on this trip went and bought designers' uh, glass frames because they were 70 euros cheaper than, than, than in Brussels. <laughs> so there was everything available. And the average Libyan was going about his business without any frown on, on his face. There was nobody worried. In fact, after each uh, NATO raid, Libyans have a practice of going into the town centers, and they did that in Tripoli, and firing their guns in the air to actually show defiance to NATO and by way of expressing their confidence that they will be victorious. And there were a lot of shells lying around. Unfortunately, I forgot to bring them. I, I picked some sou 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 souvenirs on another occasion. I, sh I shall be able, able to show you. So Libyans are not, obviously, Libyans are suffering. They deserve our support and they deserve our sympathy. More than that, they deserve that we tell the truth to our own people and try and turn them against this war. This war won't be turned by my speech. This war won't be turned by people demonstrating. This war can only be turned by the working people of this country refusing to cooperate with, with this criminal war. We recall with pride and with legitimate pride when we say at the time of the young Soviet Republic Dockers led by that great form, the great communist, no longer with us, Harry Pollitt, actually refused to load the ammunition that was sent for the Russian Far East in order to fight against the Bolsheviks. And Lloyd George's government was forced to call off the, the intervention. If the British working class was to follow that glorious example, then there would be nothing to let this war carry on. It, this war would carry on not, not long before the British Army runs out of ammunition. And, and I hear they're running out of it now. But it can be made to run short of it much faster if the British working class simply says, we are not cooperating with this criminal war. Now, when we take this question to various organizations which are supposed to be fighting for the rights of the Palestinians or supposed to be fighting against, uh, uh, against war everywhere else, what do we get? We get sniveling comments from people who are great trade unions saying, you can't tell our workers to do that at a time of uh, a recession. They're already losing their jobs, so you want them to lose their jobs. These are, these are the would-be revolutionaries. These are the people who are prepared to fight to the last drop of blood of the last Palestinian, the last Vietnamese, the last anything. But they can't possibly be asked to do anything just in case it should hurt somebody's wage packet. Working class, the class, ruling class in waiting cannot behave in such a Philistine way. It's got to go beyond that. It's got to say, yes, of course, we are prepared to suffer. And every revolution in the world has the immediate effect of bringing down the standard of living of ordinary people. If you are worried about not lowering your standard ever, you will never be involved in any progressive act activity. And I think it's our job to drive this lesson home. Hopefully the working class, which is now under great attack within the centers of imperialism itself, while they're actually asking people to pay taxes to wage criminal and predatory wars abroad, they are being asked to take pension cuts, make greater contributions, work longer, and be made redundant into the bargain so that the bankers can be paid. Imperialist crisis has come full circle. It's a crisis of overproduction, which the bourgeoisie has tried to actually delay over a long period of time. The crisis of overproduction then turned into a speculative boom and a busting of the bubble with the banks and the imperialist system in a state of near meltdown. To save that whole system from actually melting down, the imperialist governments have pumped huge amounts of money. And what's the result of that? The governments themselves are bankrupt. Nobody can insure anybody against risk because the people who are supposed to insure are themselves going bankrupt. Monoline insurance companies are going bank bankrupt. Banks are going bankrupt. And the 
Countries are going bankrupt. Greece is it's only a question of days. It's not a question of even weeks when Greece, Greece will go bankrupt. Now, by some fudge, you can say Greek hasn't technically defaulted. You can say it's, you know, the, 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 the bondholders have voluntarily rolled over the debt. Well, if they voluntarily roll over the debt, it wouldn't be voluntary. No bondholder voluntarily rolls out it, over a debt. If they're simply told, you won't get paid if you're being unreasonable. Any stubbornness would, stubbornness, stubbornness would not bring any, any results to you. So, but the result of that, of course, is that it will not be a technical default, which means the people who are protected against that default, I can't take you to these into cases, credit default, default swap agreements, they would not be able to claim their money. Because the people who have insured them saying, well, no, no, these countries have defaulted. They're just voluntarily uh, agreeing with the creditors to roll over, the, over their debts. So the whole system is getting clogged up. And who in the end is the loser? Who is the one who is actually going to suffer? It's the working people. And it's the time that working pe people understood that the cause of their social emancipation is inextricably linked with the cause of liberation of the oppressed people. Lenin was fond of repeating again and again that the struggle for the emancipation of the working class would be nothing but a sheer fraud and a humbug unless the proletarians of Europe were connected closely and unitedly with hundreds upon hundreds of millions of slaves living in the colonies and semi-colonies. This is a lesson we should take to heart, not respect Lenin by having a picture of him on the wall, putting garlands around it, burning incense in front of it. No. If Lenin is to be respected, he is to be respected by accepting his thesis on imperialism as to how imperialism is to be fought and what should be the relationship between the working class of, of, of Europe uh, in the centers of imperialism and the, and the working people uh, and the oppressed peoples in, 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 in other countries. So it's very, very important for us to, to, to do that. We are told that Britain and America and France want to bring democracy. They want to bring democracy to Libya. <laughs> Comrades, theoretically, it's inconceivable that imperialism stands for democracy. In economics, it stands for monopoly, and in politics, it stands for domination. Imperialism strives for domination, and is doing no different in Libya than it is doing in Iraq, in Afghanistan, and 100 other places over the last 100 years. It's trying to dominate Libya. It's not fighting for democratic rights. President Obama says, when he updated the nation on what our nation was involved in, he said, Colonel Gaddafi has denied the Libyan people freedom. He has terrorized and killed his opponents at home and abroad. I just take his word for granted that, okay, that's what he does. But who is it saying that Colonel Gaddafi does that? <laughs> the chief executive of US imperialism in my own lifetime, admittedly it's a long lifetime, but still one single individual's lifetime. They've killed four million Koreans, three and a half to four million Indochinese, one and a half million Indonesians, two million Iraqis, tens of thousands of Afghanis, and tens of thousands of people in many other countries. These are the people who are trying to tell you that you must respect human rights, that you must not terrorize people, you must not uh, do, do this again. Okay, this would be very nice, really, if they were concerned about human rights. Or if they actually, even in the present condition, they applied their human rights measurements equally to other countries. Well, we're told that Syria has killed 1,400 innocent protesters. Don't want to start the discussion about Syria, but there is also insurgency in Syria. And the insurgents there are not peaceful protesters. They've killed close to 200, 200 uh, members of the police forces and the armed forces in Syria. But let's, so the 1,400 would include that as well, if the, if the 1,400 is correct. Not more 
about two years ago, just over two years ago, in its operation against Gaza, Israel killed over 1,400 people and terrorized the population. You heard nobody among the freedom-loving Democrats of the NATO powers asking for a no-fly zone over Israel. You did not hear them say that Israel should vacate its occupation, that stop turning Gaza into a large prison camp. Not so long ago, this ruling family in Bahrain, and Bahrain is really not a country like many of these Gulf statelets, it's an oil well with a, with, a, with a flag and a constitution written either in Washington or London. It killed dozens of people in order to suppress them, and they really were peaceful protesters. They had, they had no guns whatsoever. Saudi Arabian troops marched in to help the, the emir of uh, Bahrain, and not a word was said about another country in Bahrain. Now, there are no equal standards, but we understand that. Imperialism has no friends. It has interests. Its interests are served in protecting Israel and in the autocracies of, uh, and, and the, autocracies of, the, of the Gulf countries, including the most disgusting of them, the Saudi Arabian one. And its interests are served by opposing regimes that are independent, the regime in Libya, the regime in Syria, the regime in Iran, etc., etc. We also have a duty to learn the same thing. We don't have go and have this measurement. There's an Arab Spring going on. This took place in Egypt, it took place in Tunisia, and now it's started taking place in, in Libya, etc. What's going on in Libya, what's going on in Syria, is as different from what went on in Tunisia and, 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 and Egypt is, uh, as, as, as uh, chi, 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 chi cheeses from, from Chong. They're two different things. And we have a duty to support the independently minded Syrian and Libyan regimes. And we have a duty to tell the imperialists to keep up. In any case, whatever is going on in these countries, it's the affair of these countries. Let it be so sorted out internally. It's up to the people of that country. If there's a civil war tomorrow in Britain, it's the affair of the British people to sort that out, not of the French, not of the Americans, not of the, uh, the, the, the Indians, mm -hmm. and not even of the Libyans, much though they have reason to, to start, start fishing in it. It's not their business. It's, it's, it's an, it's an in, internal uh, affair. And this is really what makes me very, very uh, annoyed indeed when I see people in the left-wing movement in organizations like Stop the War Coalition, who, as soon as the Libyan insurgents rose up in revolt, and the Libyan government tried to suppress them, they had a demonstration. You would have thought they hold a demonstration for what? Not in support of the Libyan government, against the Libyan government. They took people on a walk to the Libyan embassy and tried to hold a demonstration against that. That stopped the war coalition for you. But it became very soon clear that they had actually put their foot in the wrong place. And a month later, they tried to say there should be no war. There should be no NATO war against Libya. <clears throat> and what's the reason for there should be no NATO war? We also say there should be no NATO war. We want Libya to win. We want imperialist forces not to be waging a predatory imperialist war in the name of protection of human rights, democracy, and, and, and freedom. But stop the war coalition's argument was that NATO war would unite the Libyans behind Colonel Gaddafi's regime and therefore it would be more difficult to overthrow it. A more sophisticated defense of counter-revolution you could not find even in the government of David Cameron because if they had understood that they wouldn't be waging this war. And it is true, it's uniting the Libyan people. Yesterday's Financial Times was moaning we run out of military targets. What should we do to achieve our aims? And they admit in that article, they admit in that article, that NATO's aims were different from the, the sanction given by the United Nations Security Council resolution. That resolution was to enforce a no-fly zone. But NATO's aims were to topple the regime of Colonel Gaddafi. And NATO is not achieving that. So what can we do? They say, of course, the next thing would be to bomb the civilian facilities, which means utilities, electricity supply, electricity grids, water supplies. And you think if you did that, 
that would be protecting civilian lives. People will die in the same numbers as they died in Iraq. Because if you deny people the modern means of existence, you take away their water supplies, you take away their electricity, you're denying them the right, right to live. And these are the people who talk about, about, about humanitarian. But they say, we can't do that. Because it will unite the Libyans even more behind the Gaddafi regime. And what's more, it will split the coalition. And there are dissensions within each country. This war is not popular in the imperialist countries, but especially this war is not popular in the United States of America. So there are pro pro problems with waging this war. There is a stalemate, and this stalemate will not be working to the advantage of the NATO and its, uh, and, and its flunkies in Benghazi unless NATO actually introduces ground troops. But when you introduce ground troops, Libyans may only be six million people. Each one of them is armed and is waiting for NATO soldiers to come up. When you put boots on the ground, there is a certain kind of equalizing that takes place. Libyans have no answer to the Air Force. But if there is a hand-to-hand -hand fighting going on between NATO forces and the Libyans, it would be rather difficult for NATO to unleash on every occasion friendly fire on their own troops. <laughs> and the peasants all over the world have shown that they are just as good marksmen in using AK-47 as are their opponents. So if they can't control Afghanistan, if they can't control Iraq, they will find themselves in exactly the same position. They won't be able to control Libya either, or Syria, or Iran, or wherever they are, uh, uh, else they are, they are, they are, they are tar tar targeting that right now. So we have, um, we have a duty to actually explain to our people that this war is a predatory war. It's not a war for human rights. It's a war for oil. It's a war for dom domination, and we have a duty to oppose. And we have a duty to oppose the opportunists within the left-wing movement who actually act as air raid shelters for social democracy. The trade union leadership, the anti-war movement are absolutely in the grip of those whose job it is to protect and support the Labour Party. And we've got to learn to expose them. We must not be in any way motivated by a desire to keep on good relations with the John Reeses of this world, the Andrew Murrays of this world, who are nothing but sophisticated agents of imperialism in the working class movement, and we have a duty to actually, actually expose them. <laughs> we had this debate before. And you know, people will say to you, you are British, you earn your living here, you've got a British passport. And I don't mean me, I mean every one of you. Why do you oppose <coughs> our boys when they're risking their lives to fight? Two points. First of all, at the moment, our boys are mis risking no lives. There's no soldiering honor in what the NATO pilots are doing. They drop bombs from far away on their victims who cannot resist. Even Nazi Germany, when it fought, because of the powerful opposition it met from Britain, from the United States of America, and above all, the mighty Soviet Socialist uh, uh, Soviet Union, they actually fought against equals who could hit back. Libyan Air Force is in no position to hit back at NATO Air Forces. And secondly, even if NATO soldiers were actually risking their lives by going and fighting the Libyan people, NATO, NATO troops should not be risking their lives. They should not be there. NATO soldiers should be saying, it is not a just war. We have no business to be in Libya. We have no business to be in Iraq. We have no business to be in Afghanistan. We will not fight. Soldiers have known sometimes to have said no. And I think our soldiers should be able to do the same. Working people's children have been put into uniform because they cannot find any other jobs. This is the only secure job that they can find. So a disproportionately large number of poor people are in the army. Ed Miliband, Tony Blair, David Cameron, Dr. Liam Fox, they want to fight these wars, send your own members of the family. Just find out how wars are fought. Don't rely on, the, don't rely on working, working people. 
whose lives don't matter to you. It's very easy in a glib and somber manner, wearing a black tie, stand up in parliament and name the la last soldier that has been killed in Iraq or Afghanistan. And then go home and enjoy yourself because you're fooling the working people of this country as well as oppressing people abroad. So it's, it's our duty to tell people that it's not a question of being traitors to this country. There are lots of things we love about our country. We have produced some world historic literature. We all, or nearly all, love Shakespeare. We like Sh love Shelley. We lo love Milton. We have produced some world class scientists. We have done, we were the first people to make the bourgeois revolution. We led the world in that. We were the first people to create, produce a first working class revolutionary party, the Chartists. We had the general strike of 1920. These are things to be proud of. But we also have shamefully acted as the strangulators of other people's freedoms for over 250 years, from the nearby Ireland to the faraway India, Africa, etc. And it's not that particular heritage we want to claim. That's the heritage we deny, and we shall not go along with that. It's not a case of being ashamed to be British. It's a case of being ashamed to allow our ruling class to oppress other people for so long as the way it has done. Our attitude is the same as that of Lenin's Bolsheviks, who were proud of their language, who were proud of the world historic literature produced by the great Russian people, who were proud of the fact that, that they'd done a number of things, but who were absolutely ashamed that Tsarist Russia had acted as a hangman of the European and Eastern people's uh, um, uh, re free freedom, freedoms and liberties. That's what we are. But Lenin's Bolsheviks could at least say, we are proud now that we have produ produced a most militant working class movement which will put pay to Tsarist imperialism and to capitalism and will once again be able to reclaim the honor of all that was best in Russia. And that's what we are working for. Unfortunately, we are not in a position to say that our movement, our working class movement, is so militant that we will achieve that. But just because we are not in a position to do that now does not mean we give up the aim. The aim is there. It is an ideal to work towards. And as, and I'm really just about to close up, as Marx said, there are sometimes years, 30 years, when absolutely nothing happens. No change takes place. And then suddenly all of a sudden history moves and there come days in which are enclosed 30 years. So the, our day will come and in the, nay, in, in the words of uh, the great Russian uh, writer Chernyshevsky, there will be joys and festivities in our street too. But for the moment all I want to share, share to you is there's nothing shameful in going to Libya and saying to the Libyan people, comrades, we stand with you. We are not on the side of our ruling class. Our ruling class has no job to be bombing you. Our ruling class is immoral. Our ruling class is a degenerate ruling class. It's not the rising bourgeoisie that brought liberty by fighting against feudalism. It's a, it's a dying bourgeoisie which is trying to prolong its life, has actually been trying to prolong its life for over 100 years. Its days are numbered, and as a, you know, it, it's the, as a dying person strives ever so hard, to, to live longer, as a gambler who's losing his money tries try to throw the, you know, throw in more money with a view to recovering some, the bourgeoisie is doing exactly the same. But I have no doubt that historically it's gone, its days are numbered, and there will be days when all this would, this disgusting system where one human being exploits another, where one nation exploits another, would be a forlorn memory, which really would not be a part of people's lives. People would be able to live lives which are free of racism, which are free of oppression, which are free of exploitation, national or any, any, any other one. That is why we went to Libya and we went there, talked to people for no more than two days, but we got the impression of what was taking place in that country. There are some pictures before you go, have a look for those pictures. They obviously don't present you with a whole picture of the entire country, but we were able to get some representative samples of NATO's destruction. They have bombed parliamentary buildings, um, which were national heritage sites under, un, uh, under UNESCO's listing. 
they've bombed civilian areas. They, they are, their only hope now is somehow they find a silver bullet which kills Colonel Gaddafi. And that's what they're doing. The whole campaign is centered around now to actually get him personally. They quite rightly know that he is, of course, the head of that, that resistance. But I have a feeling that even if they were, and I hope they don't get it, him, even if they were to get him, Libyan people will continue to resist. They are not going, going, going to give in. That regime is not Colonel Gaddafi alone. They have people's committees. There are people who are involved in defending their standard of We went there. There were some of us who actually were skeptical. They didn't expect to find Libya the way it was. And they went. You could not find a shanty town in Libya. You could not find a dilapidated building. Workers, ordinary peasants, live in good houses. Every Libyan has a rent-free accommodation. Every Libyan has a car. Every Libyan has a television. And they don't all tune on to the CNN. Every Libyan has a radio. Every Libyan is actually able to live a comfortable life. He does not starve. He's got everything that, 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 that he needs to do. Something that we cannot in this country, com, country claim. And so for majority of the Libyans, there's a lot to defend. Although I would not deny that there's a minority who would like another system. Isn't there always a minority who will gain? I mean, the Soviet Union has collapsed, but we can't say nobody gained. A couple of dozen thieves have cornered the wealth of, that the Soviet people built up over, over seven decades. So there will be in Libya who will be there. The opposition belongs to the followers of the former King Idris. Some of them are feudalists. Some of them are fundamentalist slaf, slaf, slafiers. Some of them are straightforward page, aid, paid agents of CIA and M MI6. And some of them would like to do much bigger businesses than they're able to do at the moment, moment in Libya. So it's a ra ragtag and a combination. But they can't agree with each other. There are actually gunfights within the opposition itself from time to time. When our great liberator, William Hague, was there in Bangladesh, <laughs> a bomb went off just outside the hotel where he was. And we thought it must be the opposition telling him, don't interfere in our country. Actually, it's one of the two groups that are fighting each other over the control of who should be in charge of the, of, of the opposition. So imperialism has not only problems with the Gaddafi regime, it has problems with its own flunkies. Because the flunkies cannot agree who should be head, head of it. They are fighting it, it, it out. And they will not last. If, even if the Gaddafi regime was to disappear, they will not last for very long. They'll, be, they'll, 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 they'll literally be fighting each other to, to death. And I would say, well, that's not really a bad spectacle. <laughs> <laughs> so, comrades, I've taken already too much of your time. And it's, you might feel cheated. It's not as much a report of the visit as to say why we went, why we support Libya. Because our information, apart from the two days that we were there, is not very much greater than, than yours. We did talk to Libyan officials, but that heartened us. It heartened us that nobody was panicking. Neither the officials nor the ordinary people. They take life as it is. OK, so we're being bombed. We will win. And they are they're actually certain. They were bombed in 1986. <coughs> Reagan launched raids on Colonel Gaddafi's <coughs> residence in, with a view to killing him. He survived. His daughter died. And 60 other people died. And they emerged out of it stronger and victorious. And I haven't got the slightest doubt. They will emerge out of this crisis as well stronger and victorious. <laughs> Um, other than uh, if we want the future that uh, he pictured, we've got a, an awful, awfully strong fight on our hands. And anybody who wants to come and join us, please uh, see us, and uh, you know we can use all the help that that uh, we can get because uh, the, the fight is very long and it's going to be very hard, and everybody's assistance is appreciated.